So, we are now going to discuss the roving frame or the machine that makes roving. If you look at this slide, we will see that the product that we made earlier to roving preparation is a sliver. The sliver is a very thick mass of material. We have to convert the sliver into a thinner product which we call roving. You can see the roving bobbins here and from the roving bobbins, we have to actually make a yarn and these are the bobbins which contains the yarn. So, from sliver to roving bobbin, from roving bobbin to yarn bobbin which are also known as cop. This is the transformation of the sliver to yarn and the machines which you require to transform a sliver into yarn are one is roving frame and the other one is ring frame. So, we will be discussing about these two machines in this course. So, first let us discuss the roving frame that is how do we convert a sliver which is shown here in the can into a roving which is wound on a package we call it roving bobbin. What are the objectives of roving frame? First objective is to transform the sliver into roving by drafting or attenuation. The second objective is to insert little twist into the roving so as to make it strong enough to sustain the winding tension during package building. If I just stretch a sliver and make it thinner, it is very, very weak and it is so weak that you will not be able to really handle it, to pack it and therefore, what we need is to impart some strength and the only mechanism through which we can impart strength to an assembly of fibers is by twisting it and hence, some amount of twist needs to be inserted into it. And the third objective is to form a package which unravels easily and also suitable in size for ring spinning machines. When you study the ring spinning machine, you will see that what is, what could be the maximum package size, feed package size which is a roving bobbin in this case. And you will also understand the importance of unraveling the roving from the roving bobbin. The reasons will be discussed in the, when we discuss the ring spinning in more details, but what is important for us is to know that the form of the package should be such that the roving should be able to unravel or will be able to unwind the roving from the roving bobbin very, very easily with a minimum force, so that the roving does not get stretched by any means. So, these are the three objectives of the roving frame. Now, we will discuss roving machine configuration. If we look at the machine, we will see that the machine cons consists of four parts actually. The first part is a creel, the second part is a drafting unit, the third part is a twisting unit and the fourth part is the packaging unit. So, the entire machines can be thought of having four different units, a creel, a drafting, twisting unit and a packaging unit. A drafting unit and twisting unit, it is shown here that the number of cans that we can accommodate in the creel is about 60 to 180. Sliver hangs that we can 
really process could be anywhere between 3.5 to 5.5 kilotex. The drafting unit has a draft range varying from 5 to 22. The twisting unit, the flyer speed which is flyer basically means the twister could be in the order of 1000 to 1600 rpm in the modern machines and the number of flyer spindle could be to the order of 60 to 120, not only 120 it can go up to actually 180. Even in very modern machines it can go beyond 200 also. So, these are the typical values, not the exact values. The packaging unit, the roving hank can vary between 200 to 1200 tex and in terms of, if we say in terms of hank in any, it could be 0.5 to 2.95 any, even one can go make it still finer, especially when you want to make a very, very fine yarn, then even we can go up to 3.5 any roving. If we want to make a yarn of 100 count or 120 count, then we need a very fine roving and therefore, we can even surpass this particular value which is close to 3 any, we can go up and up to 3.5 any. The package weight could be to the order of almost 3 kg or little less than 3 kg. Now, we are going to discuss the working principle of the machine, the cross-sectional view of the roving frame is shown and if we look at this, we will find that behind the machine, this is the part which is behind the machine where we have cans arranged in rows. So, you see the cans here, this is row number, maybe this is row number 1, this is row number 3, this is 2, 3 and this is 4. So, the cans with containing the slivers are arranged behind the machine and then from each can the sliver is withdrawn and they are then guided over some rollers so because slivers cannot move on their own. We have to you know, transmit motion to the sliver, so the sliver moves and therefore, there are some guiding rollers in the creel itself which will pull the sliver and also will move it forward and as a result the slivers will move forward and it will reach the drafting unit which is here. This is the drafting unit. So, the slivers from a number of cans which could be 120, which could be 180, all of them will move forward and will reach the drafting unit. In the drafting unit what we have? Drafting unit you have already learnt in the, in the context of draw frame. So, from the principal point of view, all drafting units are basically same. There are rollers and these rollers are moving at a faster rate. The successive rollers move at a faster rate and therefore, whatever is fed to it, they get stretched. So, therefore, here also we have, we will discuss in more details, the drafting unit as we feed this liver, this liver gets stretched. There may be three pair of rollers or there could be four pair of rollers sometimes. So, the purpose of the drafting unit is to stretch the sliver to the requisite amount, which could be 8 times stretch, we can give it 10 times stretch, we can give it 12 times stretch. Typical stretching or draft that we keep may vary between 8 to 12 usually. After drafting, the drafted roving or drafted fleece will move out from the drafting zone. This is very, very weak and what we need? is to basically put twist into it. So, we have a unit here, this particular unit where we have twister and we call them flyer. We will learn about them in more details. So, the flyer is the twisting unit in this case. It turns at a speed of 1000 rpm or 1200 rpm or maybe 1500 rpm. And it keeps inserting twist into the roving and the flyer itself also helps in building or in winding 
the roving around the bobbin. So, we can say that flyer has two functions, we will understand them in more details. It is imparting twist as well as it is helping in winding the roving around the bobbin. So, therefore, the fleece is twisted and then we call it a roving now and the roving is wound around the bobbin. The material what is wound on the bobbin which could be almost 12 inches in terms of length. So, we make the, the roving, we lay the roving in the form of layers. So, we make layers after layers and the bobbin gradually build up. Typically, a roving bobbin may be having 40 layers of roving. So, 40, 42, 45 that is the typical values and to lay the roving on the entire length of the roving bobbin, what we need? We have to keep moving the bobbins up and down. We will discuss this mechanism in more details that the roving bobbin sits or stays on a platform and it keeps moving up and down and by doing so, the roving is spread out over the entire length of the roving bobbin, which is predetermined. And by doing so repeatedly, we keep laying the roving in the form of layers after layers. And by the time the bobbin attains its full size, we stop the machine and we remove the full bobbins and then it is replaced by empty bobbins and we start the process again. That is how the machine is going to work. Now, we are going to discuss the first part of the machine that is the krill part. Now, what is krill? Krill consists of a frame and positively driven guiding rollers for moving the slivers. So, a sketch is drawn here. See, these are the cans row 1, can 1.1, we may have 30 cans or 40 cans in a row. Then row 2, first can is shown here. Then row 3, 3.1, that is the first can in row 3. Row 4, 4.1 basically indicates the first can in row 4. The rest of the cans are behind it, so they are, they are not visible. But we may have, if we have let us say 120 cans, then we each row will have 30 cans. If we have 180 cans, then each row will have 180 by 4, that is also minus 45 cans or sometimes if 45 cans cannot be accommodated in a row, we will see that then in that case we may have not 4 rows of cans, we may have 5 rows of cans also. All depends how many cans we have to keep behind the machine or in a way how many spindles we have. Okay. The creel therefore, is a very simple in terms of constructions. The design is such that the cans contain slivers occupying minimum space. So, the creel has to be designed in such a way that the cans which are going to be placed below the creel they should occupy minimum space. Space is very, very costly in any industry. So, you always try to minimize the space requirement. So, the machines are designed in such a way that it consumes minimum space. Hence, when we need to accommodate 150, 120, 180 cans behind a machine, we have to always think of how much space it is going to occupy. How do I arrange the cans so that I need minimum space? So, creel design has to take care of this aspect. The other important thing is, slivers are lifted from the cans and moved forward by positively driven guiding rollers as shown here. These rollers are 
the guiding rollers. They are positively driven. Basically means they get a drive from one side and this driver is simply wrap, wrapping over it and the frictional contact between the guiding roller and the sliver is sufficient enough to move the sliver forward. There should not be any slippage. You have to make sure that the, when the guiding roller rotates, the sliver should not slip. That means the friction between the guiding roller and the sliver should be strong enough to make sure that the motion is transmitted from the guiding rollers to the sliver. The other important thing is the distance between the guiding rolls should not be too large as slivers may get stretched due to its own weight. As you see it here, if the sliver is hanging between the two guiding rollers, there is free space and we have to ensure that due to its own weight, the sliver should not get stretched when it is hanging in between the rollers. If we keep the distance too large between the two guiding rollers, then a long length of the sliver will be hanging. And in that case, there is every possibility that the sliver may get stretched. Therefore, the distance between the two guiding rolls also is very, very important from the point of view of actual quality of the roving. You will not be, you will not be able to notice it. The effect of undue stretch of the sliver or uncontrolled stretch of the sliver in the krill will be manifested in the yarn it in the form of long thin place. Therefore, keeping in mind the strength of the sliver, the machine manufacturers have decided what is the optimum distance that we should maintain between the guiding rolls. So, we should try to understand that this distance between the roll is also important so that the sliver should not get stressed. Okay. Now, we want to study this part in little more details that is arrangement of sliver cans in the creel. As we said earlier that we have to accommodate so many cans in the creel. Now, let us say there are n number of spindles in a machine. Each spindle would need one sliver can. If we have n spindles, then we must be needing n cans behind the machine. Let us say the diameter of the drop frame cans are DC. Each can, drop frame can has a diameter. Typical diameters of a drop frame can could be 50 centimeter or 40 centimeter, something like this. We must remember that drop frame output cans a little smaller in diameter in comparison to the card cans, they are larger in diameter or the feed cans in the breaker drop frame are larger because you are feeding the card cans there. But after first passage of drawing, the cans that we produce, this diameter is little shorter, it is little smaller. And why they are smaller, you will be able to appreciate gradually now why we had to make it smaller. It is not that we cannot make big cans on drop frame also. We can make it, but we deliberately do not make it because of some reasons. So, let us say drop frame diameter can is DC diameter of and distance between the successive cans let us say is X as shown in the diagram that between the two cans we have to maintain a small distance. They should not touch each other. Even though touch it may not matter much, we can have X almost close to 0 also, but for is the accessibility or movement of the cans, some little space we have to leave between the cans. Therefore, the distance between the centers between two cans is DC plus X as shown in the diagram. Now, if we have to accommodate N cans, the length of the machine that we need to accommodate N cans is n into dc plus x. So, dc plus x is the distance between two cans. If we have n cans to be accommodated because we have n spindles, the total distance that we need require that is the length of the machine that we require 
is going to be n into d c plus x. For the last two kinds, we need a little bit more because we need one more d c because we have to have space for this part. Suppose this is the, in this case, if I say we have three spindles and three cans, the total distance is going to be from here to there plus this much and this much, this and this. So, d c plus x, d c plus x between the two cans and then we need another half d c here, half d c here. So, there is almost 3 d c. So, 2 d c plus x plus 1 d c also. So, for 3 cam, but this is a formula which is little not exact, but approximately let us say it is n time d c plus x. Now, if we have 120 spindles as an example, if we take can diameter typically let us say 60 centimeter or 0.6 meter and x let us say is 5 centimeter that is between the cans we leave a little space which is 0 0.05 meter. Then the machine length to accommodate 120 cans is going to be this much that is almost 78 meter. A machine of 78 meter length is actually too long even for the industry. Therefore, to shorten the length, we need to arrange the cans in multiple rows. So, hence we can say that if I line up the can one after the other, 120 cans, we need almost 78 meter length of the machine and that is a too long a length. So, we cannot have such long length. So, we have to reduce the length. So, what we can do? We need to arrange the cans in multiple rows. Instead of one single row, we have to go for multiple rows. So, now question comes how many rows? So, one single row is not possible, it makes the machine too long. If we go for multiple rows, how many rows? Two rows, three rows, four rows, five rows. So, if we go for two rows, then the machine length is going to be 39 meter. If we go for three rows, the machine length will be 26 meter because we have to accommodate it in that case 40 cans per row. If we go for four rows, we have to accommodate 30 cans per row, total number of cans is 120. We need 19.5 meter length of the machine. 19.5 meter is reasonable and therefore, from the point of view of length of the machine and hence, this is what is normally chosen. That is, we are made to arrange the cans in four rows and sometimes also five rows when we have to accommodate 180 or 200 spindles in a machine. If the machine length is given, one can also estimate the number of cans per row. Suppose for 21 meter machines, we can roughly estimate what is going to be the number of cans in a row, we can from this formula, we get a typical value. So, this gives you some idea, the exact length of the machine will little more because we have to accommodate the head stock also on both sides. So, it is not that we are accommodating only the cans, uh, only the spindles or the cans, we have to also accommodate the heads. So, total length of the machine will be little more, but this analysis gives you an idea that we need to arrange the cans in multiple rows and why do you generally prefer four rows. Now, question comes that if I want to arrange the cans in four rows, how do I arrange them? This is how a typical no, diagram is shown that this is how the cans are arranged. So, we have in this case cans 1, 2, 3, 4 is going up to not up to 32, it should be up to 30 or if you go up 32, then we can accommodate more number of you know, 4 rows, we can have so if you let us say make it 32, when 33 it will be another, it will be then 64, from 64 
from 64 will start from 65 and it can go up to 96 and then we start from 97 and it can go up to 128. Each row we will have 32 cans. So, this is how the cans are arranged. First two rows are quite close to each other, then we leave a passage. Here we leave a gap. This is basically a the passage for the operator to move because sometimes if the sliver breaks, he moves under the krill and he, he has to take care of the sliver, he has to take out the sliver from the sliver can and put it on the guiding rollers. So, he has to mend it and therefore, a passage is required and therefore, first two rows and between third and fourth row, there is a little gap that we leave. We can machine length, there is a formula which has been given by the company called Ginser. We all know that Ginser is a very renowned company. Uh, they have some formulas, there are some more companies are there, those who manufacture these machines and uh, the LMW in India also manufacture these machines. Similarly, Toyota is another company which also manufactures these machines. So, there are many companies who manufacture these machines. So, this formula states that L is going to be 1200 plus X plus 188 millimeter given by this company where what is the value of x? x is number of spindles into spindle gauge by 2. The denominator 2 is due to 2 rows of bobbins, not cans, is bobbins in front of the machine. For g equal to 220 millimeters, so if the machine gauge is 220 mm called spindle gauge, not machine gauge, spindle gauge that is the distance between the centers of two spindles. Then x value is going to be in this case 30, 13.2 meter or 13,200 millimeter. Therefore, machine length will be 1200 which is constant, but this value which is x plus 188 and total value is going to be therefore, 15 meters. So, if we know the gauge of the spindle and you know the how many spindles we are going to accommodate, we can estimate the length of the machines. Today, machines are made in modular form. So, one can buy a machine with 32 spindles, 64 spindles or 96 spindles like that because they are coming in modules. And therefore, while setting up a plant, if somebody wants to work out how much length the machine is going to, how much space the machine is going to occupy, then one can find out the length of the machine using this formula. The other things which is important for us to know is now the arrangement of spindles or the bobbins. See the machines as if you remember behind the drafting system we have a creel and the creel we have to arrange the cans. Now, in front of the machine there are spindles and there each spindle will take care of one bobbin and therefore, all the bobbins are in front of the machines. Let us say the spindle gauge is G that is the distance between the centers of two successive bobbins as it is shown here. So, in this diagram bobbin 1, bobbin 2, diameter of the bobbin is dB, this is the full bobbin diameter and there is a space left between the two bobbins which is Y because we do not want we have to make sure the two bobbins should not collide. The flare which is rotating around the bobbin they should not collide with each other. So, we have to leave some amount of space between them and that space is let us say is y. So, g in this case is going to be how much? 
the distance between the two bobbins. So, 2 into d b by 2 plus y, now y is the allowance between two successive bobbins. If we have n spindles, length of the machine required by the simple formula is n into z. We are directly multiplying by the number of spindles. So, it will be n into d b plus y that is going to be the length. So, from the n bobbin that should be the length. So, let us say now an example that we have 120 spindles that means, we have 120 bobbins and let us say bobbin diameter maximum diameter is 16 centimeter. The y is the gap that we leave between two bobbins is let us say 10 centimeter. Therefore, g is going to be around 26 centimeter and hence length of the machine is going to be length required to accommodate the spindles plus length of the head stock. Length of the head stock let us say ignore for the time being and therefore, the length to accommodate so many spindles is going to be around 31 meter if you calculate by this simple approximate formula. 31 meter is also very too long a length from the machine size point of view and hence to reduce the length what we should do? Again we have to go for not one row, but we have to go for at least two rows of bobbin. Otherwise the machine will be too long. Hence to reduce length the bobbin needs to be arranged in two rows instead of a single row. Therefore, the bobbins are arranged in two rows. Now, question comes how to place the bobbins in two rows? There is another important consideration. We will see that I mean, this arrangement is one bobbin behind the other. This is one type of arrangement. The other arrangement is on the right hand side, they are staggered. So, which arrangement we should prefer and why we should prefer? In both the cases, it will satisfy, it will reduce the length of the machine from 31 meter to 15.5, let us say almost 16 meter, excluding the length of the head stock. The bobbins cannot be placed one behind the other. Why? The delivery from each drafting unit has to be aligned with the spindle top and hence the arrangement has to be staggered. See from the if we from the drafting unit as the the delivery from the drafting unit or the one drafting you know the nib of the drafting rollers has to be aligned with the spindle top because from roving will emerge from the drafting roller nib follow a straight line and reach the flyer top. Now, if, if I keep another bobbin along the same path, then the other roving twisted roving which is emerging from the, the neighboring you know, drafting unit or neighboring drafting roller, it has to cross, it cannot follow, it has to cross and reach and that, that kind of arrangement is not going to be good that will cause the roving to break. And therefore, from the alignment point of view there is going to be a problem and what to do is to go for the arrangement type B. Here I can if, if I draw it like this, here is a drafting unit from which the roving is emerging, it will come straight and reach here. There is another emerging point, the neighboring drafting unit. From here, the roving will come and straight will reach here. Like that, it will go like this. 
we will not have any problem. Whereas in this case, if I draw a line from here, one is reaching there, the another one which is here, it has to go like this. This is going to create problem. Therefore, this kind of arrangement we cannot have. We have to go for arrangement like this, which is staggered arrangement. Therefore, the machine should have two rows of bobbins and the arrangement has to be staggered the way it is shown in the diagram. From there, the other important thing we are going to now learn is spindle gauge and its significance. Now, here I am showing the circles that you see here are basically representing a bobbin, a full bobbin and their cross-sectional view are shown like a plan view of the bobbins if you imagine. From the top you are looking at the bobbins, they are full, so the circles are representing the full construction of the full bobbins. Now, if we join the centers, this is a staggered arrangement and if I join the centers of these bobbins, we get a triangle A, B, C. Okay. In the triangle A, B, C, the angle alpha is also shown. Now, what is cos alpha? Cos alpha is C D by A C and therefore, how much is C D? A C cos alpha and the value of A C is how much? H is going to be 2 into d B by 2 plus y because we have half d B here, half d B here plus y is the gap that we maintain between the two bobbins so that they do not collide with each other. So, from here to there that A C value is going to be this much d B plus y. Therefore, C D is going to be d B plus y into cos alpha. Now, take an example. Typical value of d B could be 15 centimeter. That is diameter of a full bobbin could be around 15 centimeter or 16 centimeter. That is around 6 inches or 6 and half inches maximum. We can also make bobbin of 4 inches, 5 inches. But if we want to accommodate more material in a bobbin, we have to go for larger diameter. And typical diameter nowadays is around 6 inches or 6 and half inches. If you convert it 6 inches to centimeter, it will be 15 centimeter and that gap y let us say 10 centimeter and this is a, like as a assumption it could be 8 centimeter also, it could be 6 centimeter also, let us say 10 centimeter. Now, if A B C happens to be an equilateral triangle, then alpha is going to be 60 degree and in that case how much is C D? C D is going to be if we put the values, I will get it 12.5 centimeter. C D is going to be 12.5 centimeter, but what is the spindle gauge? It is B C. So, if we go to find out the value of B C which is going to be spindle gauge, then this value is going to be 2 into C D twice C D is basically spindle gauge and therefore, spindle gauge is going to be 25 centimeter. C D is 12.5 and hence B C is B twice of that 25 centimeter of 250 mm. That is a typical value that we get. The other thing is center to center distance between two rows of bobbins. That is we want to know what is A D. So, A D is going to be A C sin alpha and therefore, it is going to be in this case 21.65 centimeter. So, distance between B C is 215 or 25 centimeter and A D is going to be 21.65 centimeter. Why A D is important? We will see that influence of this angle alpha. So, if angle alpha and what is its influence? 
for various values of alpha 60 degree, 50 degree or 40 degree we have calculated the spindle gauge and also the value of A D. If we calculate, if we use that formula and calculate the values, we get these values as shown in the table. That is, now if we study this table, then what is the conclusion we make? As we increase alpha, the gauge is decreasing. See, as we increase alpha, we go from 40 to 50, 50 to 60 degree, the gauge, spindle gauge is decreasing and therefore, what does it mean? What is the practical utility of this? Utility is that if the spindle gauge reduces, we will be able to accommodate more spindle per unit length of the machine. So, that is the advantage we will get that for a given length of the machine, if I want to have more number of spindles, then I have to reduce spindle gauge. In that case, I have to increase the value of alpha. The way I should place the bobbins, that alpha must increase. So, that is one effect of alpha. The other effect, the other consequence of this is the distance between the two rows is actually increasing. If you see, it was 160 when the angle is 40 degree, it increases to 216 when the angle is 60 degree. And what does it mean? If value of AD increases, that basically means the bobbin rail width is going to increase. So, the consequence of alpha is that if I increase alpha, I can accommodate more bobbins, but that will be at the cost of increasing the width of the bobbin rail. And different manufacturers are optimizing this, but this will be the net effect of this. Now, we are here, we are giving a typical specifications of a machine and this specification may vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So, some rough idea one must have and this is given here, the bobbin size is 12 inches in length and 6.5 inches in diameter. There is the maximum value nowadays which is attained, but sometimes we go for 6 inches, we can go for 5 inches also, typical values. So, it is roughly if you want to remember, it is 12 into 6 which is easy to remember. If you do not remember 0.5, it does not matter. So, 12, 6, if you remember 12 inches length and 6 inches diameter, typical flare speed up to 1500 rpm revolution per minute. So, we can keep it 1000, 800, 900, 1200, whatever you want. It can go up to 1500 rpm and uh, do not we do not go beyond this. Why do not we go beyond this? Also, there are reasons also we will learn about them. The delivery rate of the machine is usually 30 meters per minute or little less than that depending upon the type of material we are going to process. For man-made fibers, we can go still higher you know, delivery speed because these fibers need less twist. The other thing is draft in the machine can vary between 3.5 to 16, that is the count range we have already discussed 0.5 to 3 any almost we can have any roving. Power consumption 5.5, 0.29.3 kilowatt depending upon the number of spindles that we have in a machine. Pneumophile fan motor will consume 4 kilowatt of energy. The compressed air requirement could be there in some machine because the drafting roller needs to be compressed by compressed air and that uh, consumption 3.6 to 1 your uh, meter cube per hour. The pressure is around 5 to 6 kg per centimeter square and the number of spindles can vary between 
96 to 180, even we can go for less than 96 also. But for a production scale machines, which is commercially successful, it could be anything 96 to 180. Even some manufacturers have gone up to almost 200 or little more than 200 also. So, with this we close the very first introductory lecture about the machine that is roving frame. Thank you. Thank you.